praise the Lord. There is power tonight in the blood of the Lamb. Thank you tonight, guys. Praise God. And I'm glad tonight for Jesus, aren't you? Glad for what He is doing. I'm glad for what He's going to do. Tonight, to today. All right. All right. Brother Gary, is that today? No, starts next week. Next week, okay. Um, Brother Dean Caldwell is at Huntsville Assembly starting next Sunday. And that'll be, I'm certain that will be running through next Wednesday night at Huntsville Assembly of God. If you get a chance to go up there and uh, be in service, I know that they will appreciate that and be in prayer for it as well. Turn with us tonight to the book of Acts this evening. To the book of Acts here tonight. Acts chapter 16 tonight. Acts chapter 16. I was praying this afternoon and talking to God. Acts chapter 16. And I feel like God spoke some things into our spirit. Acts chapter 16, verse number 27, Acts 16 and 27. And it says, And the keeper of the prisoner, on awakening out of his sleep and seeing the prison doors open, he drew his sword and he would have killed himself, supposing that the prisoners had been fled. But Paul cried with a loud voice, saying, Do thyself no harm, for we are all here. Then he called for a light, and he sprang in, and he came trembling, and he fell down before before Paul and Silas, and he brought them out, and he said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thine house. And they spoke unto him the word of the Lord, and to all that were in his house. And he took them in the same hour, in the same hour of the night, and he washed their stripes, and was baptized. Baptized he and his straightway. And it says, And when he had brought them into his house, he sent he set meat before them and rejoiced, believing in God with all of his house. Would you pray with me tonight? Heavenly Father, we thank you again, God, for this wonderful privilege of being in the house of God tonight. I thank you, Lord, for your blessings, God, that you've given us, Lord, and the spirit that we feel here in our midst tonight. I pray, God. God, that you would help us, Lord, to speak for you. I pray, God, you to be our leader, to be our guide. May the Holy Ghost anoint us tonight, God, for in ourself we can do nothing for you, Lord. But I pray for you to be our helper tonight, God. Everything that's been done and everything to be done in the remaining part of it, may it glorify you and you only. And we ask these things in Jesus' name tonight. Amen and amen. You may be seated tonight. I was praying this afternoon and talking to God and God began to deal with us about some of these issues and things that we're going to bring forth here tonight. It says in verse 31, and it said, And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, and thy house. I begin to think about the Philippian jailer at this point. You realize prior to this, we, we kind of started at the bottom of the story. Paul and Silas had been cast into prison, had been beaten, and many stripes had been put upon them. They'd been put fast in stocks. And the Bible said they began to pray. And about midnight, there was an earthquake, and the foundations of the prison was shaken where the and the stocks that were on their legs and, and the bonds that was on them fell off. And not only off of them, but off of all of the prisoner. Now, under the way the law had been written up, the jailer or the keeper of the prison was to give his life if any man escaped from there. He was going to die at the hand of the soldiers or at the guards or whomever when they came in. So that's why this prison keeper 
acted so hastily. He, he realizing now that the doors of the prison that he was supposedly guarding was open. Now the stocks was there and the prisoners is loose. This man supposing that they've escaped, but God was in the midst of that and he realized Paul and Silas was placed there. And I thought about how far that, they, that God will go to reach a man. Now here's a man that's lost and undone without him and they thought that they were doing the great work going again what Paul and Silas was doing. You realize why they weren't beat because they had been crooks. They weren't beat because they were robbers or thieves or stealing somewhere but they were beaten for preaching Jesus Christ. They was passed in there because they was preaching and teaching in the name of Jesus Christ. Now now no doubt the devil thought well this will shut these boys up for a while. I put them in there but I want you to know something. God turned that around on him. Did he not? He cast them in there. They cast into the common prison cell and they begin to rejoice and sing and talk to God and have a prayer service there in stocks and bonds. Now church no doubt the jailer probably listened to them for a but he realizing these boys not going to do no harm. I'll drift off to sleep and he's fast asleep when the earthquake shakes that place and the Bible said that when he rose that Paul evidently saw him somewhere because Paul cried out and said do thyself no harm. Do thyself no harm or other words he knew that this man was going to harm himself and that man came forth. He realized that there's somebody still in this jail. I want you to know something. There was more than somebody still in there. There was one in the midst of them that had been there all the while and that's the Holy Ghost. Amen. He's dwelling in the midst of them. Paul and Silas begins to see sees from these men's lives that they've got something more than just anybody out there. They've got something in their life that I need. I want you to know something child of God. He didn't just keep it to himself, did he? No, sir. The Bible said that he took it home with him. Amen. I like that. When I read that this afternoon, I read down through here, verse 33, and it said, and he took them in the same hour of the night, and he washed their stripes, then he and was baptized, he and all of his. Amen. Straightway. I mean, there was more going on there, church. You can read on down through there where it talks about him and his house and his people there, his family. I begin to look at that. What a blessing. It started out for that guy as another day on the job. It started out as just another prison watch. But I can tell you God placed that man there that day or that night. God put him there in the presence of Paul and Silas and he knew what's going to go down. God knew that but God sending that Holy Ghost convicting power of heaven. It rested on his soul and that man said I need what these men's got. Amen. I can tell you church it would do us good if we'd not hide what God's done for us. That man wanted his family to know what God's done for me today down here in this jail cell. I don't know if it happened like this or not but can you imagine if that man stood somewhere in a testimony service and he stood and he testified and said I tell you folks I, I want to stand and give the Lord a word of praise tonight for what God's done for me. For I would have took my life down there had it not been for Paul and Silas as they shared the Lord with me. Oh friend, where would you and I be tonight had it not been for the Lord? That man realized that there's something more to life than breathing air and eating a good meal and living a few years of time and going somewhere and filling a grave. He knew there's more to life and living than just this right here. And he wanted what they had. They witnessed to him Jesus Christ and he wanted to share with not only himself but he wanted his family to have he had. Oh church, may God stir us again that we take the word of God to our family. May God stir us again that we'll share with what with our families what Jesus Christ has done for you and I. I thought about what an eye-opening experience that it must have been for him there. What a time 
he must have had in his life. And we can read over there in the 11th chapter of the book of Acts and the 14th verse and it says, and who shall tell thee words that wherefore, speaking about Cornelius here, whereby thou and all of thy house shall be saved. When Peter went down to witness to Cornelius, Cornelius received the Lord, not only him but all of his house was saved. Church, I can tell you there's some things that we need to grasp a hold to. Men's dying around you and I every day that we live. And I think sometimes to myself, Lord, could we have done more? Could we have said something else? I go to people's homes day in and day out on the job and work in a lot of different areas. And I'll go to one here and there along the way and then it won't be long till I hear somebody say, well, did you hear that so-and-so passed away? I'll go into homes. I find people there, husbands and wives. And I'll hear one or the other say, well, my husband just died or my wife just died. And I think, oh God, it ain't been but two or three weeks or months since I was here. It's not been all that long since I saw him last. And I wonder if I'm speaking about me, not you. But I wonder, God, are we making an impact on this world that's lost and dying and filling up a grave and going to a devil's hell? Oh, church, Paul and Silas was in prison, but they impacted those that were around them. Amen. With the power of heaven resting in their soul, they realized and they knew that we're going to do what we're going to, we're going to work for God while there's a day. We're going to do all that we can do in this thing, God being our helper. They weren't just floating along, but they were doing the will of God. We find here in verse number 31 or verse number 30. And he said, and they brought them out and they said, Sirs, this man said to them, he said, what must I do to be saved? You can sense the hunger in this jailer. You can sense a desire in him. The Bible says, let me just back up here. And he said, when verse 29, said, then he called for a light and he sprang in. He came trembling and the Bible said he fell down before Paul and Silas. And he, and he, and he said, and then he brought them out and he said unto them, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? He's desirous to have what they've got. Church, the world needs to see what you and I've got. They need to see the Jesus that lives on the inside of us as we live day-to-day lives. They need to see Christ in us. They need to see the Lord in our action, in our walk, in our talk, in our daily life. If ever they're going to realize that there's more to life than what I've got, they must see Christ through the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. That can only come from a relationship with Him. That can only come as the power of God flows into me and into you that it will flow out. There can never be an outlet where there's not an inlet. You do realize that. There can never be an outsource until there's an in source. I can tell you, brother, He promised us in the Word of God. He said, I'm not going to leave you without a comforter. I'm not going to leave you without a helper. I'm not going to leave you here alone. I'll send him. I'll send him back. And he sent the Holy Ghost to live on the inside of us, brother. And he tells us down through the word that we can have all of the power of heaven that we want. And when we desire to have God in our life, God will move and bless and touch and lift up. And it'll not only stay in you and I, but it'll be a river that flows out of us that'll touch hearts and lives around us. Amen. Amen. That you can give a comforting word to a hurting soul. You can speak a word. Listen, church, there's a world of people out there that's dying lost without Jesus Christ. And they're not only our families, but they're people that we care about. They're people that we're concerned about. It said in John 4 and 53, and it said, So the Father know, the Father knew that it was at the same hour for that in which that Jesus said unto him, Thy son liveth, and himself believed. Now this is speaking about when the little boy was healed in the book of John. And he said that he and himself believed, and his whole house. Now notice this. It didn't just happen to one, 
but it happened to the whole house. Why? Because they saw what God had done for the life of one. Church, we need a family revival again. Amen? We need a family revival again where not only one gets saved, but the whole house gets saved. You used to see things like that, did you not? You used to see when people would gather in and maybe one in the family would get saved and it wouldn't in the same revival meeting there may be a whole family a mom a dad and a sluice of kids and every one of them give their life to Jesus Christ and begin walking with him and living for him I can tell you the devil hates that because the devil is doing everything that he can to destroy the family and the homes and the lives they're in but I can tell you this tonight mom and dad I can tell you this husband and wife what we need more than anything in our homes not another trinket or a shiny object or a better house but what we need more in our homes than anything else is the presence of the living God. Amen. We need the power of the Holy Ghost moving within our life. Brother, sister, man, man or woman can only buy one thing to furnish their home. I tell you what I'd rather have in my home than anything there is. That's the living word of God. Amen. Oh brother the enemy don't like that because I've turned to it many a time when I didn't know what to do. I've looked through it through the ceaseless ages when it seemed like I was at an end. But I found out that God's the same, Brother Alan Smith, yesterday, today, and forever. And if we'll put our faith in the Word of God, things and mountains that seem impossible to pass are movable by the hand of an Almighty God. Amen. Amen. But when we put God in our lives, He becomes first. He becomes foremost. And when we have that in our life, then things that things go in our way that God will be there for us. You say, preacher, you mean because you're a Christian and you're a child of God and you don't ever face? I never said that at all. We face things just like the world faces. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I know sometimes we kind of, we get the mentality of thinking this ain't fair because I'm going through this. But we go through things just like they do. You suffer hurts just like they suffer hurts. But there's a difference. There's a difference, is there, preacher? There's a difference. We have people in our lives that that we love and we've gone to church with and we've been fellowship with and friends with and our family members they pass if they know God they're saved and they're a born again believer we've got a hope that the world ain't got you know what that hope is that one day we'll be with them again the newness of life the world don't have that I've seen that in the world I've, I've done I don't know how many funerals but a bunch I've stood by cast Caskets. I've stood at the head of, the, of a many a casket in the last 20 plus some odd years. I've watched family members file by. I've watched the church member come by. They'd look in that casket of people that they've sat in the house of God with for years and years and they knew that one day they're going to be with them again. I've watched that husband that loved that wife for, for years and years and years. They'd lived for God. They'd walked with the Lord. I've watched them walk by and file by that casket and they'd look down on that husband or that wife and tell them I'll see you again. Amen. I can tell you that's the hope of the child of God. Amen. It don't just end down here brother but we've got a hope that goes beyond that. Why on earth friend wouldn't we want to tell that to the world? Why wouldn't we want our family to hear that? Oh friend hear me today. Our families need to know beyond a shadow of a doubt about the love of Jesus Christ. They need to know beyond a shadow of a doubt about the goodness that the God that you and I serve has and the ability that he has to do great and mighty things. Brother and sister, we live in a time when Jeremiah said this. He said, for thus saith the Lord. He said, stand ye in the way and see and ask for the old paths wherein the good way. And he said, and walk therein. Amen. And he said, and walk therein. And he said, and you shall for your souls. But they said we'll not walk therein. But Jeremiah told them, he said, seek you for them and walk in them. Brother, sister, I know there's a lot of people that says I don't want to hear it. I don't want to walk that way, no way, preacher. But I can tell you, friend, there's no comfort in anything else. There's not a place of rest nowhere else. Because Jeremiah said if we'll walk therein, what are you going to find? You'll find rest.
best for your souls. Amen. I can tell you, brother, sister, there's hope in serving Jesus Christ. There's a hope in living for God. This world's perishing without a hope. But for the child of God, our hope is in Jesus Christ and the things that he's prepared for them that love him. Hallelujah. Amen. But Paul says here, we find in the word of God, verse 23 of Acts 16, and he said, and when they laid many stripes on them, they cast them into prison, into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely. And he says, who having received such a charge, he thrust them into the inner prison and he made their feet fast in the stocks. Listen to what Paul has said in the midnight. Paul and Silas prayed. Now, I've, I've loved this, this right here in the Word of God, and I've, I've preached from that passage many a time. But the Word of God says, And they prayed, and they sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. Do you realize there was two things happening there, probably more than two, but two I want to point out tonight. Paul and Silas prayed, and they were strengthened. And they sang praises, and they were strengthened. Not only were they strengthened, but those around them that were perishing without a hope heard them. Now you think about what a hope that a man would have had sitting in a dark dirt dungeon with stocks on his legs and on his feet. I was reading here uh, in the commentary of my Dake Bible. And it was talking about the, the, the stocks that were on their feet. The pain and the agony that it brought them. Just being in those bonds and being held captive and not able to move. But at midnight after many stripes... Now, I'm going to tell you, this wasn't a whipping probably like a few of us has got in our time. This wasn't a little little switching and they went in there, just went in there and sat down. Ladies and gentlemen, they beat them. They meant to hurt them and if they killed them, then oh well, they died getting their punishment. They beat them very vigorously and laid many stripes upon them. They put them in a jail cell now and they're sitting there in the stocks in the coldness and the darkness of the night and they're praying and they're talking to God. And old friend, I can just imagine in my mind uh, uh, what that situation must have been like. They didn't have a, they didn't have a cot somewhere to get home. They're in the dirt floor there in the dungeon. No doubt they can hear the cries of some of the other prisoners as they sit by there. Can you imagine with me for a moment of time of the stench that was in this place? Can you imagine of the smell that reeked from out of there when you have a place filled with people that's in chains like you would chain up some type of animal? These men are living in very, very bleak conditions. But Paul and Silas, they don't know how long they're going to be there. And they begin to pray. And they begin to seek their God. Listen, church, they begin to pray. And God begin to stir something down on the inside of them. God began to stir up something on the inside of them. I don't know if they had their eyes closed or they just sitting there in the dark saying oh Jesus you've been so good to us. No doubt Paul's talking to him saying Lord I remember what you've done for me. I remember when you saved my soul. When you filled me with the baptism and the Holy Ghost. When you opened my blinded eyes as I came off that Damascus road. I remember God how good you've been to me. I remember the blessings that you've given me. I don't know how they prayed, but man, they begin to pray and they begin to not only pray, but they begin to rejoice. Think about that. That's what singing is. Singing is rejoicing. They was counted worthy to be beaten, to be in prison for Jesus Christ. They're singing the songs of Zion. They're praying and talking to 
that God and the Bible said and the prisoners heard them. Amen. Now don't you realize there was a critic or two in there probably that listened up for a while and said I wonder what they've got to be so happy about. They was beat within an inch of their life like the rest of us before they was put in there. But after a while they began to feel the glory of God as it filled that. How do you know preacher that the glory of God filled it? I'm going to tell you something folks. Something ironic happened there. You don't lose a house full of prisoners and open the doors and them sit still. (laughs) They're going to run. That's the nature. But God was in their midst. God was in their midst. I've been in a many a service and the power of God would move and the Holy Ghost would move and things of heaven would move. I didn't want to go home either. Amen. I didn't want to go home either. I liked the atmosphere in which I was in. I, I can tell you those men liked the atmosphere where they were. They liked what they felt. They loved the presence of God. They wanted the more. They wanted to be in that. Why? Because there was something there that they had never had before. Amen. What was it, preacher? Peace. Yes. Peace. I can tell you where the presence of God is. There's peace that surpasses all understanding. When the presence of God floods into your soul, regardless of the turmoil that you're in, regardless of what you're faced with, there's something that happens on the inside of you. You may not understand it or you may, but it's the peace of God that settles there. And it gives you the assurance that whatever comes, I know everything's going to be all right. Either way. And I can tell you that's what these men around Paul and Silas experienced. They experienced the presence of God which brings peace. Amen. And they could sit by as everything else fell, come in. And that jailer realized that I need in my life and not only in my life only, but in my family. My family needs this. My family needs this. And he took it home with him. He took it home with him. Can you imagine with me for a moment of time, no doubt the man that kept the prisoner was not just a little old bitty sissy. He was a tough man when he walked through the door, no doubt. His family got their attention and said, Oof, he's home. But can you imagine that night now he's brought two out of the prison cells with him. They're bruised, they're bleeding, they're beaten. He sets them down at his table and says, get us some water and some soap. We're going to clean these boys up. That wife and that family says, what for? What did you bring them home for? How would you get them out? He says, I just want to tell you something about these two men. They've got something that I desire. And they've got something that you need. They've got something in their life that changed them that they're willing to die for. They've got something that they're willing to be beaten over, cast into prison over, but yet they still pray and they still worship and they still glorify God even in the midst of all adversity. He said they've got something that they need. No doubt that wife could tell that there's a difference in this man. Those children, that family around there could tell that this man had something that changed about him. I can tell you brother or sister, you don't have to get a t-shirt that says I'm a Christian when you've been born again. The world's gonna know it. Amen. You don't have to write it on your back and carry a sign that you're a child of the king brother because of the change that's been made in your life. I can tell you Jesus Christ will make a difference in every man and woman's life that it will allow him in to change them. There won't have to be anybody notified that that person's been saved. Amen. Won't have to be anybody notified they've been born again. I can tell you this much tonight, church. It makes a difference in your life. It makes a difference in your life. Not only will it make a difference in your life, But when we bring that into our life and when people around us see, they can tell that you love God. I remember growing up and as I was growing up, I growed up and and, and, I've never lived for God for a great deal of my life and 
was just associated myself with a lot of folks that didn't live for God. But I can tell you this much, there's a difference in that age and in that generation than there is right now. And I, and I, and I, and I it troubles me somewhat. That generation had respect for a Christian whether they were one or not. If they knew you were a Christian and you lived for God, they wouldn't say things that they'd say around everybody else in front of you. If they loved, if they, whether they lived for God or not, they wouldn't say bad things or things that was not needing to be said at all. We live at a time right now men could care less who you are. That's the difference in the generations. That's the difference in the time framing. But I can tell you this much, church, I can remember being lost and undone. See a Christian coming. No day as a man and woman of God, I'd try to avoid them. Because it would bring conviction into my life. Because I knew that my life was not the life that they lived. And I had a friend, I had a great friend that was a, was a Christian. And me and him, we started, we started spending a lot of time together. At that time, he was probably the only friend that I had that was a Christian, and for sure the closest one. When, but I, I've looked back on that in time, and I can never remember a time that he would pass judgment on me or condemn me, although there was a lot of times he would tell me and say, Steve, that's, that's not a good thing. You know, you don't need to do that. You know, that, you know, you need to get away from that if you could stay away from it. But he was such an example to me. And I can remember as lost as I could be, I can tell you this much, I felt peace when I was around him because of the presence of God that was in his life and the witness of God that was there. Yes. And i never forget throughout the course of time the impact that that guy made in my life, just living day-to-day -day life, going through things, and he showed me that there is a life to live, that we can live for God, we can serve God if we want to. I want you to know something tonight. It'll make a difference in your life and my life. Not only will it make a difference in our life, but it'll make a difference in those that are around us. I never forget when I got saved, and I've been saved a long time. I'll never forget when I first got saved. I gave my life to Jesus, and I started living for God. I thought to myself, I thought, well, I don't have many friends in this world that's Christians at all. And I thought to myself, I thought, well, I know that my I know that living for God means more to me now than what living out there in this world does. But I thought, God, I'm going to serve you. I, I you know, I love I love a lot of the guys that I've run around with and had all those things with and done all that. I, I, they're my friends. I still love them. But I thought, God, if they can't like me as a Christian, then they'll just have to not like me. And I remember thinking that, of course, I was a young man then. I remember thinking that. I thought, God, this is not going to be easy. But I'll never forget when I stuttered and stammered around, and I told him, I said, guys, I can't do this tonight. We, I worked, and when we'd work, we'd get off in the evening time, and, and, and just, it just wasn't good. It wasn't a good picture. i never forget when I said, guys, I can't go with you today. Can't do it tonight. Why not? I just can't. I've, I've given my life to the Lord. You did what? I said, I got saved. Huh. I had a lot of say, ah, that won't last long. Ah, that won't, you, you, you know, you, no. I can tell you something, there was a change made, and it made a difference. And it's not only made a difference then, but it's still making a difference tonight. Because I still want him in my life. Amen. I still want him. And I can tell you something, folks. Some of the same ones that ridicule me, some of the same ones that's laughed and poked fun at me, when they got down in a need, yeah. I've walked into that hospital room, and they are sure enough glad to see Steve coming in. I've had a lot of people ridicule and talk and say things. 
And I'd think, Lord, am I getting anywhere? Am I getting anywhere? But I've led them, some of them, to the Lord. I can tell you something, church, it means a lot. You can walk in there to people that you've gone with and run with from the time that you've grown up. You can walk in there and they're coming down to the sundown in their life. You can look over at them and say, Bud, don't you think it's time that you get things right in your life with God? Don't you think that it's time that you make this change in your life to serve Jesus Christ? See them look up and say, yeah, I think it's time. Amen. I think it's time. I can tell you something, church, it makes a difference. It made a difference in that jailer's life, him serving God. He shared it not only with, didn't just keep it to himself, but he shared it to all those around him. Made a difference in his life and those that was around him. What a difference Jesus made in our life. What a difference he'll make in yours as well. Would you bow your heads with us tonight? Amen. What a friend we have in him. Paul and Silas no doubt shared the gospel of Jesus Christ with those in that place. And it made a difference. I ask you tonight in this house, before we come to the close of another Sunday evening service, if there'd be one person here tonight, you have never received Jesus Christ as Lord. I want to ask you something tonight. Would you be willing to serve Him? Would you be willing to let Him be Lord tonight as He speaks to your heart? Maybe you're just sitting here and you've come, you've come into church and just filtered in and, and just, but you personally have never given your life to the Lord. And you've been thinking about it because you realize that we're running this thing down. Things is coming to a close and you've, you've heard it preached to most of your life. You've been around this thing enough to know that this old world's coming to an end. Right now you realize that if Jesus Christ returned tonight, where you would stand in eternity, and you want to make a change in your life personally. I wonder if it would be one person in this house tonight. She'd say, Pastor, that's me. I, I, I want Jesus into my life. I've been around this thing, I, but I've never for myself accepted him as Lord I've never accepted him myself personally I want you to come tonight I believe God's speaking to a heart right here tonight listen to me it's more than a formality it's a life it's a life would you be willing to come and accept him tonight I believe the Spirit of God speaking to a heart somewhere. Young person, I don't have a clue who. Somewhere in this house tonight, you want to accept Christ as your Lord and Savior. If you'll get up tonight from where you're seated at and make your way to this altar, we want to pray with you. Anywhere tonight, swallow the lump in your throat, come on. You're just unsure where you spend eternity. Not a bad person. Just need Jesus. Just need Jesus. Come on tonight. Anywhere. Anywhere tonight. Praise God.